happening. We receive by faith that you give us triumph and you cause us to experience victory, going from victory to victory this morning. So Father, we just thank you that we are victorious in you, that you always cause us to triumph in you today. So we enter in through and by the precious blood of Jesus that gives us the blood-bought right to stand on an open heaven today. And so, Father, we enter in by grace through faith that gives us the blood-bought right to have answers to our prayers, to know that we are the beloved, the accepted, the chosen by you. That we are peculiar. Father, we just thank you that this is our receiving day. So we come praying for those who have authority over us. We pray for our president. We lift them up to you right now, his cabinet, vice president, elected and appointed officials. We lift them all to you, Father. And we just say, come thy kingdom, be done thy will. We take authority over this virus in the name of Jesus. Corona, we command you to die and you are to be submitted under the blood of Jesus right now. And we arrest your authority in the earth. And so, Father, we just declare that our nation is a nation that is founded upon you. And you said you have the heart of the king in your hand to do your will. So, Father, we ask that you give our president wisdom. You give him uh, direction, insight, Father. We just declare that only the uh, wisdom surrounds him and the wicked and the treacherous, we ask that you root out and cause to remove from office, Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for our man of God. We thank you for all that are watching. And we declare that, God, you have them dwelling in a place of peace and safety. And the Lord is their shepherd and they shall not want. So we thank you in advance for your word as it goes forth. It will not return unto you void. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. And all that agree said, amen. Amen, amen. Well, thank you for just agreeing with us in prayer. And we know that prayer has power. The Bible says when any two of us agree on earth concerning anything that we ask, it will be done of our Father which is in heaven. So we know that God loves and he longs to answer each and every one of our prayers today. And so we just thank God for you. And we're just going to jump right into the word of God. I believe that God wants to speak to your heart. And confirm some things that perhaps you've already heard or things that maybe um, are trying to challenge the authority of the word of God in your life. And so we believe that his word prevails, that the word of God is prevailing in every area of your life. Last week, I taught on build an ark and I want to continue on that this morning. Um, We looked at several scriptures concerning Well, not really a whole lot. I think we kind of stayed in Genesis chapter six. But I want to look at some things here, even concerning what Jesus said concerning Noah's life, because I think one of the lessons that we can get from Noah is the fact that Noah understood how to experience deliverance from destruction. And I know that this is a very dangerous time in which we live. One of the most dangerous um civilizations in all of the world is this time in which we're living. And so even in the midst of that, Noah learned from God. He learned how to experience deliverance from destruction, deliverance from lack, deliverance from bondage. He know he knew how to experience deliverance from danger. And so in the book of Mal in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, let's look at that. And it describes that even during Jesus's time, there was a reference to uh, what Noah was experiencing as well. And so let's look at, um, we'll look at the King James translation for this one. And then when we go over to Noah's life and the stories of uh, that describes Noah's life, we'll look at a couple of scriptures just to kind of give context to the setting and the time in which he lived. So in Matthew 24, verse 7, it says, um, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus was referencing during his life and his ministry, he says, as even the days of Noah were, He says, so shall it be um, coming of the son of man. 
in verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. And so Jesus references here that they were during that time. Um, and he says, just as it was during Noah's time, so it will be during his time. And even upon his return, that all were in a place of immorality Before the flood came, the scripture says they were drinking, they were marrying, giving into marriage. And as a result, Noah prepared the ark. Now look over at Genesis chapter six, and we'll see that same description here of what Jesus spoke of. And then we'll go into some new things on today. In Genesis chapter six. Let's look at what was going on during that time in verse 11 of the Amplified Version. Genesis 6, verse 11 in the Amplified. During this time, it says the earth was depraved and putrid in God's sight. And the land was filled with violence, desecration, Infringement, outrage, assault, and the lust for power. And God looked upon the world and saw how degenerate, he saw how debased and vicious it was. For all humanity had corrupted their way upon the earth and lost their true direction. And I know... If you think like I think, this is very similar to what's going on in our world today. Is that the earth during that time was depraved and the Bible says it was putrid. Like vomit in God's sight. Just all the things that were taking place in the earth. All of the violence, the outrage, the assault. And the scripture says the lust. For power. So we have to ask ourselves, how did God deal with this situation and how did Noah deal with this situation? God spoke to his life and God told Noah. And God is still speaking. And I believe that God is wanting to speak to you concerning your life. How to respond. And so God's direction to Noah was make an ark. So I want to talk this morning about building yourself an ark because that was the response to all that was going on in the world during that time, all the things that were taking place. And so it is the same thing that we're experiencing that people are drinking, giving into marriage, in marriage, all kinds of violence in the earth today, um, assault, Outrage, lust for power, the same thing we are seeing in the earth now. And so like Noah's lesson is for our lives that we can take from his example, build an ark so that you can be delivered from the destruction and not be in a place where that infringes upon your life and causes you to lose your liberty and to lose your life and freedom in God. And so we want to just really look at this because I think it's so critical for us to really get a hold and glean from Noah's life and the lessons that we want to uh, endeavor to share with you today. Because I want us to understand that we can secure our lives. And last week we talked about how this Teaching on building an art could also be a blueprint for entrepreneurship and leadership or management in some form or fashion. But I want you to 
recognize that there were two people in Noah's time, those who were a part of Noah's family who were delivered and those who were outside. And as a result of the covenant of God, and as a result, they lost their lives. And so it's so vital that in the midst of corruption and decay and all the things that were going on, that God was able to provide certainty and a uh, level of security in Noah's life. And so let's uh, start here in chapter 6. And we want to pick up where we left off last time with number 12. Some of the things that Noah did as a result of being able to build himself the ark. We looked at the ark. It is believed to be about the size of a standard football stadium and a half. Um, The size of it is about 100,000 square feet, something along that line, but it was three stories and it had the compartments and all the different capacities to take in all the animals and then for him to, for Noah to take in his son and their son, his son's wives, his wife. And um, so it was really um, showing how God was concerned in so many areas and wanted it to be spacious enough. And so Noah took several years, you got to understand, in building this ark. It wasn't as if, you know, he got the word from the Lord and then all of a sudden, He uh, was able to build it in a few days. And we understand from the scriptures how it spells out that it took Noah quite a bit of considerable time to construct this thing that God wanted to do. So you have to ask God, what is it that God wants to do in your life? What 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 is it that God is wanting me to um, be delivered from? What is God delivering me from and how am I going about maintaining my deliverance? And so God was delivering Noah from corruption, from the violence, from the outrage, from all the perversion, the, you know, sodomy and all the things that were taking place. It was as if, you know, these were the the most wicked times in which uh, civilization existed. And so God gave Noah this word so that he could begin to prepare himself. And so he took time to put the things in place so that he could prepare for God's um, intervention in the earth. And as a result, um, I'm sure people during that time when they saw Noah building the ark, he and his team or his sons and those who were part of building the ark probably thought Noah was crazy. Noah, what are you doing? Why are you building an ark. It's not even a cloud outside. I mean, it's no water, no rain, no cloud in view. But yet, God was preparing Noah. And God was building something inside of Noah. He was building that revelation of deliverance from destruction, deliverance from the world, deliverance from the world's way of thinking, the world's way of doing things, so that God could cause him to know that he was safe and that he was in a place where he relied upon the voice of God. And as a result, he was able to uh, erect things in his life, erect the purpose in his life to establish the covenant of God. And so Noah's life was built so that the covenant of God could be established in his life and in the life of his wife, his sons, his son's wife, and so forth and so on. And so we have to understand that God has always been about covenant. He has covenant on his mind. He's always in tune to establishing his covenant. And so one of the things we know about Noah is the fact that as a result of Noah's obedience, doing what he was commanded to do, that God was able to deliver. And then God put the rainbow, the bow in the sky, which was a sign of the covenant. So let's look at a couple of things that um, we understand concerning building the ark and the things that we can do in order to experience deliverance from the destruction and deliverance from danger and that's what I want you to get a hold of deliverance from lack there's such a 
anxiety and an uncertainty even concerning um, provision and things along that line. But I just believe that even as God was able to provide Noah's deliverance from destruction, I believe that God could provide deliverance um, from lack in your life and deliverance from sickness, deliverance from disease, from the fear of danger. These are so many things that we can get a hold of. And so we'll begin with number 13. We left off, excuse me, we'll start with number 12. We left off last week with uh, number 11. So the first thing that Noah had to do is he had to set priorities. Look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 27. He had to set priorities. He wanted to be in a position Noah did to experience what God wanted to do in the earth. And so as a result of that, um, Noah prioritized the plan that God had for his life and prioritized what God wanted to do in the earth over his own plans, over his own ideas, um, things that perhaps he thought would need to be taking place, but he made it a priority. Look at this scripture here, Proverbs 24, verse 27. Put first things first. Putting first things first is to prioritize. So he says, put first things first. Noah put God's plan, God's agenda first and foremost. He wasn't concerned about what was going on in society. And he didn't make that first, keeping up with what the you know world was doing and keeping up with the Joneses. But no, he was saying, prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field. And he says, afterward, build your house and establish a home. So in order for God to build uh, things in Noah's life and for the things to become manifested in the natural realm, Noah had to make a decision to set priorities. And so it is in our life that we must have God's plan first and foremost in our life. Otherwise, everything else will fail. If we have uh, the second thing first or the third thing first or the fourth thing first. How I many you know our lives are not prioritized, but we must put first things first, just like Noah did. He heard God's voice and he um, began to uh, get the instructions. And then as a result, he went ahead and, and started building the ark. So we must not get distracted from our priorities and uh, allow our lives to be out of sync. But we must understand that priorities are foundational in order for God to build things in our life. Let's move a little farther here. Number 13, be a risk taker. Be a risk taker. Look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Let's, in that same book of the Bible, let's turn to Proverbs. Um, I love the fact that, that Noah was a risk taker. Um, no one during that time was doing the things that Noah was willing to do it was only God who spoke to Noah, and as a result, Noah was willing to take the risk. Um, he did as God told him to do, and consequently, he was blessed as a result of it. Proverbs 24, uh, verse 16, it says here, For a just man falleth seven times. And rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. The Amplified says, for a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked are overthrown by calamity. So you have to understand that in order to do what God is telling us to do, we're probably going to make some blunders or make mistakes along the way. And I said last time, 
Noah wasn't a perfect man. He made mistakes. I'm sure before he started building the ark, he made mistakes we know of after he built the ark. And so he probably, you know, was able to be one who was a beneficiary of falling several times, making mistakes several times. But you know what? I just thank God for the fact that he was willing to take the risk. Because sometimes in order to make this mistake, you got to take a risk. And so when you understand the word of God and what God is saying, then you'll step out on it. And just like Peter did when God spoke to Peter and Peter said, uh, Lord, if it be thou, let me come. And Jesus said, come. And so when Peter stepped out on the water, he, you know, drowned some. But you know what? He took the risk. And just like it is in your life, you know what? In order for God to provide that deliverance and provide the things that he wants to do in your life, you may make some mistakes along the way. But thank God for the word of God. He says that as a result, you may make some mistakes, you may fall, but you can rise up again. It is not the end of the world. Because we know one word from God, one word from God like Noah got, is that very thing that causes our life and the direction of our life to be so um, on point and it is able to um, be uh, directed in the way that God would, would have it to go. And so we want us to really understand this because uh, God described here in chapter 6, and spoke to him in chapter 6, verse 14. He says, make an ark. And that ark was of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark. And shalt pitch it within and without in uh, with pitch. And so it goes on and it describes uh, what took place there. And these are the things that Noah began to do. And in verse 22, it says, and thus did Noah, glory be to God, according to all, according to all that God commanded him. Noah took the risk of doing all that God commanded him to do. He started thinking Okay, this is my assignment, and this is what God is speaking to me to do. And he aligned himself, carrying it out. And the scripture says, so did he. And then in chapter 7, the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all your house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Chapter 7, verse 5, Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah did it. Noah did specifically the things that God spoke to his heart, the different types of animals, not just all male, not just all female, but he said male and female of every clean beast, of the fowls. And God specifically gave him instructions on what to do. And Noah was one. And then it says in chapter 7, verse 7, Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. So I want you to gain context here. Noah was a risk taker. You know, if you start a business, if you start anything, if you start a ministry, if you start, you know, a committee, whatever you do, it's going to be a risk. So you have to be cognizant of that. And you may make some mistakes. You may fall down a little bit. They may say you're crazy. They may talk about you like they did Noah. They may not, you know, see the need for it or, you know, Noah was one who was focused and he did not allow the opinions of others to keep him from doing what God commanded him to do. 
Let's go to the next one, establish authority. We must establish authority. And I like to reference in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion. In chapter 8, verse 5, let's look there for just a second because we must understand authority. The authority comes from God and God has to be the authority, the final authority in our lives. And when he wants us to do things, we must recognize that it is his authority that we stand in, that we stand upon. Chapter 8, verse 5, it says the centurion uh, servant was healed here. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus says unto him, I will come and heal him. And then the centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. The servant was healed because the centurion understood authority, child of God. We must understand authority comes from God and the authority of God's word when it is released It can change situations. It changes natural things. It changes things in the realm of the spirit. And so Jesus recognized the authority that the um, centurion had in verse 9. He says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goeth, and to another come. And he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth that. And then Jesus says, He marveled and said to them that follow, verily I say unto you, I'm not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So we have to be men and women under authority, under God's authority, seeing ourselves as those who have been entrusted with his dominion. And with his authority, the authority that Jesus has, he has given it unto us through his word. And so the authority that Noah gave God over his life, the right to speak into his life and to be obeyed, that authority is the authority that Noah governed himself by. So nothing is successful. No successful organization is ever built without strong authority. We must know the extent of the authority that comes in our life and to yield ourselves and exercise it under the authority of God by maintaining it and establishing it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Lead by example. Noah, I'm sure his sons were with him. I'm sure his wives of the sons were there as well. Noah's wife and As a result of Noah going into the ark, making a decision to do all that God told Noah to do. You know what? He was leading. He was modeling. He was teaching. He was mentoring his sons. He was showing how to be obedient. The things that were necessary under the law in order to be righteous, to perform and to carry out the things that God was calling Noah to do. And so it is in our lives. People are looking at our lives. People are watching us. Your children, they're looking. You're leading them. The sons are looking up to the fathers and the daughters are looking up to the mothers. And so in the home, we must look at the example. What influence are we giving off? And so it was uh, Jesus who is our great example and model for us how to be a man who is anointed and can carry out an assignment. And so through his example that we can receive that same anointing and carry out the assignment on our lives. And we can do what God is commanding us to do. And we can have success in this life. And we can experience deliverance from destruction, deliverance from violence, deliverance from outrage, deliverance from assault. We can be free because we understand how to build our lives on the promises of God, on the protection of God. Because we have examples like Noah and we have examples like Elijah and and Joseph and Jesus and those who established the covenant of God. And so we must lead by 
example. Okay, let's look at the next one here, number 16. Number 16 is to teach, teach, teach. There were things that God spoke to Noah over in Genesis chapter 6. Um, in fact, I got several scriptures here. Noah taught those who were a part of building the ark what to do, how to build the ark. Because you understand, God was very specific. There was a certain place where the door should be. There was a certain place where, you know, they should enter in, where they should enter out. And so he had to teach all those things to his sons and teach to those who were helping and assembling the ark with him. Those who were building, take an opportunity to teach, to share, to impart, to model. So that's what Jesus did on the earth. In fact, he taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Jesus was a teacher. And he taught using stories. He taught using parables. In verse uh, 1 it says, And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of disease. So he taught the disciples, Jesus did, all 12 of them, how to cast out unclean spirits, how to heal, how to lay hands on the sick. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. There's a time where we must begin to be taught and receive the teaching. And in turn, once you know and you learn certain things, you are to share it with others. And you should allow that information and that revelation to be passed on. And so it was, I'm sure, with Noah's family and his wife and his sons, they probably were wondering, what is going on? What are you doing, dad? What are you doing, honey? And that was the opportunity for him to share what God spoke. God spoke to me to build an ark, to make an ark. And as a result, he was able to establish the covenant of God. Look at 1 Corinthians in the Phillips Translation, I don't know if you all have the Phillips translation, but I thought this was really, really good. And um, if you can pull that up, that would be wonderful. First Corinthians chapter 11. And um, if not, I will see if I have it here. I don't have that translation in my phone. But... What it says is copy him. Um, I think the King James says to imitate and to be ye followers of him. But the Phillips translation says copy me as I copy Christ. And so when you're teaching and you're sharing as a result, people will copy you. And so you want to make sure. That you're giving them a good copy. Amen? Let's continue to move on to the next one. 17 is to choose your associates. Because of Noah's life, he had the opportunity to delegate and to choose those who would be a part of building the ark. And... Um, like I said, his sons were there, I'm sure. Um, the sons that he had, I think it was three sons at that time, that they were the ones who were there and were able to go into the ark that was built from nothing to something and the years that it took to build this ark. And so it's important that you recognize that it takes um, 
like Jesus had disciples to carry out the assignment. So it was that Noah had associates. And I believe that that was his family who was able to carry out the building of the ark. And so Jesus was very uh, cognizant of the uh, uh, disciples that he chose and the men during that time who were able to be a part of his ministry under the law. It had to be men. And so Jesus was very uh, diligent about teaching them the things that they needed to be taught. Um, The ones that he chose, Peter, James, John, um, all of the ones who were a part of his life and of his ministry. And so it is even in Noah's life, the same lesson that you must make a decision of quality and choose and seek out those who can carry out the assignment, uh, have the different strengths and can be teachable and humble and receive the things that are necessary based on what is the objective. If the objective is to build the ark to establish a covenant, then you want to choose people around you and you want to choose um, those who have the capability and the grace on their lives to do the things that must be done. And so these are things that are so very vital. Um, Look at chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. Or is it chapter 9, verse 8 and 9? Let's see. Chapter 7 says, um, just, yeah, let's go to chapter 9, verse 8 and 9. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, so God's sons, I mean, Noah's sons heard God speak to them as well. So God was speaking to Noah. You got to get around people who can hear from God, who want to hear from God. You know, sometimes if you surround yourself with people who are not concerned about prioritizing God in their life, then they will affect the things that you're trying to accomplish if you're trying to hear from God. And so God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him. His sons weren't off somewhere, you know, with all the violence and the um, drinking and carrying on. And no, his sons were there with him, the scripture says, because they were hearing from God and they were modeling what. Um, they saw their father and what they saw Noah was doing. And it says in verse nine, and behold, I establish and I behold, I establish my covenant with you, Noah, and with your seed after you and with your seed after you. Let's go to the next one. Number 18, do not limit yourself. No limits. Look at Psalm 78, verse 41. Do not limit God. Because, you know, Noah might have thought, I don't need to put the animals in there. It's just enough for me and my sons and their wives to be delivered. No, God said, put two of all the different animals in the ark. And so we have to recognize the details of what God wants to do so we can hear from God and we can do what he's telling us to do, not limit based on the size. Perhaps Noah might have thought, I don't need an ark this big, you know, um, Tens of thousands of square feet. We're good with just 10,000 square feet. We can just ride it out as long as we need to ride it out. No. God said to build this thing. Three stories. Lord, we just need one story. Just, you know, no. Let God do what he wants to do and don't limit him. Look at what it says in Psalm 78 verse 41. 
Yea, they turned back and tempted God. Referring to the children of Israel. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And so that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to limit what God wants to do in the earth. God had a purpose. God had a plan for Noah to bring all the animals in for he and his family to go in. And so when God gives an assignment, when God gives a word, you know what? It's our responsibility to do and to carry out what he wants to have done and not to limit him. So many times, you know, we think based on what other people think and what other people are going to say. Oh, no. Why are you building such a big ark, building such a big ship? You don't need all that room. But no, God said to do it. And so consequently, he did. Let's look at number 19. Prepare your successors. And as we read in Genesis chapter nine, let's turn back over there. We can look at how God was preparing Noah's sons um, to carry on and to be a part. And so he says, uh, we left off in verse nine. He says, I will build my, I will, I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you of the file of the cattle of every beast of the earth with you from all that goes out of the ark and to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of my covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. The Amplified says for all future generations. And so the things that God was doing was for not just his life of Noah's life. Noah's wife, Noah's sons, but even Noah's son's children and Noah's great grandchildren. And so we must understand that God said that I put the bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a a flood to destroy all flesh. Verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. Of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah. This is a token of the covenant. Which I have established between me. And all flesh that is upon the earth. And so we must understand. That God is concerned about future generations. And that was so that they could see the rainbow. And even today in our day and time, we see the rainbow in the clouds. And that should remind us of the token of the covenant between God and the earth, never to destroy it again. And the covenant that he cut with Noah thousands of years ago. Let's go to number 20. Number 20 is to evaluate constantly. These are blueprints for those who are um, modeling and building things in their life. As I mentioned earlier, this is an area where I'm sure Noah had to go back and evaluate what was being constructed, the things that were being built. Um, There were specific things that God spoke. And so... 
You know, those instructions require detail in chapter 6 and uh, verse 14 in the Amplified. It says that the ark that Noah would make for yourself would be of gopher, of cypress wood. It wasn't just, you know, bring back any wood you can find, Noah. It doesn't matter, just any old wood, in fact, just anything you see out there. No, it was specifically where Noah had wood that was of cipher and wood that was made of gopher. And then it had to be uh, rooms. In the Amplified, it says, make it in rooms with stalls, pens, coops, nest, cages, and compartments. And so it had to have all these rooms in it and then to cover it inside and out with pinch. And so these are the things that Noah had to be mindful of and the size to evaluate. Go back and look at and make sure that it is lining up with what God prescribed. The height in verse 15, the length, the breadth. In verse 15, all those things were a part of the evaluation um, that Noah was to carry out. And even after they landed in chapter 8, look over here. Um, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assaged. And so the waters in verse three, um, it goes on and how the, 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 the heaven was stopped. The waters returned from off the earth. This was after the flood and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountain of uh, Ararat. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And then then verse six Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent forth a raven and he sent the raven out to see in verse eight, if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. So Noah evaluated what was taking place after the flood to see whether or not the waters had gone back to assess what was going on by sending out the raven and sending out the dove here in chapter eight, verse eight. He sent forth the dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground, but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him in the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand. He took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. He did it one more time. The dove came into him in the evening and lo in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So we must evaluate constantly. We must ask questions. We must begin to assess We must look into what's going on. We must inspect and we must do the things that are necessary in order for the vision to be carried out. Let's go to the next one. Number 21, do not serve two masters. Now, there were those who were outside of the covenant of God who were just heathens, worldly, wicked. But you know what? Noah decided, I'm not going to serve them. I'm not going to do what the world is doing. I'm not going to get caught up in violence and outrage and assault and all the things that are harmful to my life, my family. But I am going to serve God and I'm going to prioritize 
the plan of God over everything else that's taking place. So we have to make the same decisions in our life. The scripture says, no one can serve two masters either. He will hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and money and mammon, uh, ungodly riches. And so it was during uh, Noah's life that he had to make that same decision of quality, not to serve two masters. Let's go to the next one. Cut your losses. And so there were a lot of things that were lost here. And as a result of disobedience and things that were very unfortunate that, you know, lives were lost. A whole civilization of people were lost and swallowed up in the flood. Destruction everywhere. No telling how many thousands or if it, you know, was close to millions of people who died. But. Uh, Noah understood what he was supposed to do and as a result he was delivered his life was preserved from destruction and he could not be swayed to the right or swayed to the left because he recognized what God said would happen and that God had to establish his covenant in the earth and so he knew that as a result of that that loss would happen and loss would occur and loss is a part of life unfortunately we are seeing that more and more that um, things are happening and as a result of many instances perhaps being in the wrong place at the wrong time could create the loss of life Um, you know we've lost a lot of people and lost a lot of loved ones and it's just very unfortunate and so this is why it's so vital that we understand uh, the importance of being in the right place at the right time so that we um, as in Noah's day are not consumed as a result of being in alignment with the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of uh, darkness let's keep going here Learn to rebuke. Uh, I'm sure along the way that Noah had to address certain things and make corrections. And it doesn't have to be something negative. But um, Noah understood that perhaps when it took a lot of time to prepare the ark and maybe his emotions would rise up or things would come uh, to fruition. He was able to uh, bring them into subjection and deal with the cynicism and the sarcasm and all the things that were taking place. So he learned, that's another point, to learn to rebuke. And so um, I pray that this last point here is to make a difference in Jude 22. That's why we're wanting and endeavoring to share this lesson. Look at Jude 22. It's just one chapter. It says um, in the King James. And of some have compassion. Making a difference. So it is my prayer for you this morning. Is that you make the decisions. In your life. That will make a difference. In your generation, in your lifetime, and that these same lessons that we have studied concerning Noah's life and Jesus's life, that their lives made a difference because they were those who were covenant people and they knew how to experience the deliverance. And as a result, their sons were delivered preserved from destruction their son's children were then in the position to be a beneficiary of the same covenant and so I pray today that you'll make a decision and you'll be very honest with yourself Lord what am I building what am I 
developing as it relates for your purpose in my life, what you've called me to do, the reason why I am here. How can I make a difference? What influence can I have on my generation and the next generation? So that people can see in my life the covenant being carried out, deliverance from the curse, deliverance from darkness, from addictions, from bad habits, from sickness, disease, and that I am one who am instilling the covenant of God and the righteousness of God so that others can see. So if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm telling you, it's going to require you making that quality decision today to receive him. And so if you haven't received him as your Lord and as your personal savior, in order for him to speak to you, you've got to make a decision to become his child. So say this with me, Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus as Lord of my life. I renounce sin and sin's evil work. I thank you, Lord, for your blood that is shed for me. And that blood makes me righteous and holy. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, we have something we want to send to you. The only thing you have to do is text, I'm saved. I am S-A-V-E-D, the information there on your screen, to 51555. We rejoice. The heavens are rejoicing because you've made a decision to be a part of the family of God. What a great, great decision, the best decision that you can make for the rest of your life. Before we close, we want to give you the opportunity to sow your seed. We believe that God is a covenant-keeping God and that he says in his word that I'll never cause my people to beg for bread, but I will position them to experience the blessing over their lives. And so there are so many scriptures about how God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. So God wants you to prosper like God prospered Noah, how he prospered Jesus how God spoke to Jesus, excuse me, how Jesus spoke to the fishermen who were there fishing and they were out there all night long, hadn't caught anything. But you know what? One word from God was able to get them to have a boat full of fish to the point that their nets just began to break. And so there's a net breaking anointing when we hear from God and we sow and we plant where he tells us to plant. And that planting is in the place of good ground. And as a result of us giving, that the blessings will begin to pour out on our life, that we won't have enough to receive it, not enough room to receive. And so I encourage you today that God wants to establish his covenant with you so that he can take pleasure in your prosperity. And so there are instructions there on the screen how to give via text, the number you can call even if you want to mail it in or if you want to give via the web. By all means, let's get in on the pleasure that God wants to take with his children. He doesn't have a whole lot of time left. I believe we're going to usher in the return of the Lord. And I'm telling you, what a great way to just show out through his children, to show how blessed those who serve him and love him can be when they make a decision to abide under the shadow of the most high God. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I pray that you're blessed with the word of God and remember that anything can happen and that God is still moving and just be in expectation and know that he has something good in store for you today.